morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Katja Sipila, and I'm uh, with um, TechCrunch Finland. And uh, I've been invited here to talk about a little bit about location-based um, scheduling. Uh, is this a fami familiar concept to any of you? Uh, flow line theory or locations in scheduling? <laughs> well, of course, Minda Akas, yes. Um, so anyways, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that um, for the next half an hour. Um, so just a, a little bit uh, about Tremble real fast. Uh, Tremble is the owner of Tecla. And uh, basically uh, for their building and construction side, um, uh, they offer our, um, tools for architecture, structures, MEP trades, general contractors, owners, and site prep. Um, so the idea for Tremble is to connect the field um, with uh, Office and also the software and hardware. So they have a lot of tools um, for um, construction trades and um, different companies. Um, and one of the tools is a um, product called uh, Vico Office that uses Flowline um, scheduling. And uh, the Flowline scheduling is something that um, is widely used, for example, in Finland. Um, I think pretty much every important project is um, basically scheduled using uh, location-based scheduling. And uh, one of the reasons why, you know, maybe looking at different ways of uh, doing location or scheduling is the fact that we're not being efficient at the job site. For example, uh, here's a slide from um, a development manager at Skanska, Finland. Um, you know, he's calculated that uh, there's a lot of waste at job sites. So production is only about 30% of the time. So we're spending a lot of time on waiting, moving transportation. So basically our employees can't do their job because there's stuff that's stopping them from actually doing effect effective work. So, um, and just to, uh, to get started off a uh, little bit more um, Fun, hopefully. Um, I will play a little cartoon for you. So um, if this will agree to play. Yes, okay. This is John. He's the manager of a project renovating six blocks. He knows how important it is to have a good schedule in order to meet his deadline. So he validates expected durations with each trade contractor. John prints out the entire plan which is pretty long, over many pages, but he puts on a brave face and starts the project. It's hard for John to see if he has a good schedule with only the traditional Gantt chart based scheduling, with the consequences only being confirmed when the work has started. The results are often that workmen begin working in random locations wherever there is room for it. It can end up with days where the construction site is too crowded and days where the locations are partly empty. In the end, the conflicts and discontinuous working will sadly cause waste, delays and additional costs to the project. Instead, John tries location-based scheduling. First, the activities are transferred so that all activities and locations are clearly displayed at the same time. It's then revealed where and when the workmen will be in each other's way and the schedule can now be easily improved. First, the flow of each activity is optimized and the logic between task locations is automatically joined. This visualizes any potential ineffective use of project locations. A traditional Gantt chart approach would force early starts for constant activity on a location. However, this unfortunately means that the trade workflow is regularly interrupted. Instead, by balancing the amount of planned resources, a more uniform result is created. And John is able to have the entire schedule on one piece of paper, which will give him a better overview of the project. The purpose of this scheduling method is to make sure that different trades aren't working in the same location at the same time, to ensure continuous flow of the planned activities and exploit the construction work areas effectively. With location-based scheduling, you'll get a clearer overview of the project, continuous optimized workflow, and a more efficient 
and proven to be up to 20% faster execution. So anyway, so here we have a little view of the flow line um, uh, which uses the, these locations. So over here uh, we have a project level and then we have two buildings and we have floors for them. And then, you know, there's four different tasks. If we wanted to present this in the Gantt chart, we can do the same thing. Um, you know, and we can have little, you know, tasks for each location, but it's not a very efficient way of, um, you know, showing all these locations in the Gantt chart because one task in flow line can be eight lines in the Gantt view. So 50 tasks in the flow line view can be 15,000 tasks in the Gantt view. So try printing that. Uh, so first of all, using the flow line, it makes it more efficient to see right away all the tasks if the, you know, the schedule is good. Um, so basically what, you know, we, you know, need is to, you know, calculate the durations, um, you know, we're recording the assumptions that how long it takes to do something. We're um, highlighting, um, you know, for right now we have the schedule here, uh, you know, the calendar. Again, we have the building, A and B, floors, one, two, three, four, um, on B, each building. We have framing and three other tasks. And right away I can see that um, this is not a good schedule. There's empty space here and there's stops and starts here. Whenever you have stops and starts, it means that the crew might have to go to another job site and, or go home for a day or two. and there's a risk that they, they might not be coming back on time. So I can right away see that this is not a good schedule. And uh, if we wanted to look at, for example, February 2nd week, we can right away see that the framing is in building B, floor first um, location. And we can always see where the task is at. So right now in the yellow, we have the waste. There's nobody working on those locations. We have stops and starts. And uh, what we did now is to make that one task continuous and now we can see that you know well, there's still some waste so we're trying to make them closer together and uh, you know now we kind of uh, you know already saved some time we made them continuous and now we're giving them just a little bit of buffer you know a day or two buffers so that they the crews don't clash so even still we saved a couple weeks on the schedule by uh, actually uh, compressing the schedule by just getting rid of the areas that we're not working at and stops and starts. So basically if you wanted to try location-based scheduling, um, what do you need um, to do a schedule? Um, you would need locations, obviously tasks, quantities, production rates, and crew composition. Um, and this is basically um, very similar to, you know, just using MS Project or any other traditional critical path method uh, scheduling, except for the one addition um, that is location. So the location is the key. We're get getting the additional benefit of location that gives us the controlling tools. Uh, because in the Gantt chart, you can't really see that you're, if you're using your project site efficiently, all the locations. So locations, um, for example, this could be just a, a big shopping mall. A lot of companies treat the shopping mall project just as a box. You're, you know, building one thing in one piece. Of course, uh, it makes sense to oftentimes make it a little bit smaller. So we're cutting this project in two sections. And then we're cutting those sections into um, three stories. So we're making smaller areas uh, that the crews can work in. And we're trying to occupy those locations all the time and make sure that there's somebody working on those things. Because if you're treating this as one box, you can't, it, it, it's harder to control. And for example, in here, uh, we can have uh, uh, more locations. Uh, inside the A and D, we have four you know, locations. E and H, we have four. And so these are all basically independent locations that we can work in and not uh, affect anybody else's work. And I think a lot of companies somehow do the location-based planning a little bit uh, naturally, because if you have three buildings, you probably think about, you know, in which order you start building and so forth. So this is basically the same thing, but you're just cutting it into smaller pieces. Um, so just to optimize locations, uh, 
So there are some rules uh, about locations. How should you do it? Um, there's plenty of documentation online if you want to get familiar with it. But a lot of times we f choose the um, shortest foundation, uh, foundation and frame lead time. So we want to uh, pick uh, locations uh, that we can work at that you know gives us the possibility to start working inside as fast as possible. Um, and last location is the one with the shortest internal lead time. And, uh, and there's some rules again for the size, uh, location, maybe 3,000 to 5,000 um, BRM um, square meters. So, so you can get familiar to it uh, about the different rules, but um, it's basically cutting it to so that maybe you have two weeks of work in each location. Um, and here's a good sample from um, Skanska as well, just to um, see that, you know, if you were building a project, frame up one floor at a time. So in here uh, we have um, two different uh, sections and we have uh, at, um, quite a you know, few um, floors. So right now here's a frame was going here, here, here and here. So we're doing both locations kind of, uh, you know, uh, back and forth. And so the drywall that could start then at week 25. But what happens if we uh, used, uh, do one section or location at a time? So if we were just to build uh, the location A first, and then we can start actually drywalling at week 19. So we're actually saving six weeks in time that we can start doing, doing drywall just by you know, doing first um, section A and then section B. So we're doing continuous work, which also reduces the risk for crews and the project. And we're also saving time. So this is one of the greatest benefits of actually using the locations. We're trying to um, obviously make it more efficient. So sequencing. Uh, by that we kind of mean that, of course, you know, like in uh, Gantt charts, you can make um, you know, you, you can um, give this ta task, will start after this task and so forth. Uh, in Big Office, you can do the same thing. Uh, you can do different um, layers of dependency. So you can make a task uh, that has logical dependencies between the tasks in the same location. So in this case, um, in this location, this has to finish before the next uh, can start. So it's um, location dependency. Um, and this is in a less accurate level. In this one, um, this task has to just has to finish the section, and then it will the next one will start in that section. So we're just going to the section level accuracy. So, um, or you can do location uh, delays between the tasks itself, so that you know this task has to finish before the next one can start uh, in location. So um, now that we've uh, you know, for, for the schedule we've done locations, we kind of think about, you know, the sequencing. So in order to make uh, the most out of scheduling, especially location-based scheduling, we need intelligent tasks. And what we need, mean by intelligent task is that we have some numbers that we base our schedule on. We're not just drawing and saying that, okay, that's going to take 29 days. We're basing that something that, you know, we're actually having the software calculated. Uh, we need the resources, we need quantities, and we need the consumption. For example, in this one, uh, we have uh, 500 square meters that we need to work. We have five men working on the site. We're working 10 hours per day and uh, 10 work hours per square meter. So we are going to do some math. So we're actually uh, figuring out how long does it actually take to make that 500 square meters. And by you know, using this logic, it takes us four days. So if any of these change the quantity of material, uh, work hours, or consumption, or the resources, our duration is going to be affected. It's going to be shorter or longer. And that's based on numbers. Um, 
and we specifically want those uh, quantities by location as well. So if you're um, building a project and you cut it in three sections, you should cut in each you know, section and calculate how much of, you know, how many square meters of uh, you know, slab you're going to have on that location. So that way we can specifically calculate the duration for each location if we have quantities by location. So, um, so this is, you know, we want to be, the schedule to be based on some facts. Um, so creating a scheduling uh, or selecting tasks is that we can do different levels of um, scheduling as well. Uh, we can do um, foundations, you know, that's a big task. It has, uh, uh, it will have uh, piles and, um, you know, uh, pile caps um, and slab. And we can, you know, divide that into smaller ones. We can uh, divide that into form work, reinforcement and pouring. Um, so all of these will have their own quantities, uh, resource, and, resource and dependencies. Because for, um, for reinforcement, maybe we want uh, the weight of the rebar. For pouring, maybe we want, we want the volume for the concrete. So we're combining the quantities, consumption, and resources to make that ta task and calculate the duration for it. So quantities by location. Uh, you can actually use, you know, use a model and you can cut that model in Vico Office and uh, then get quantities by location. You can do stories first and then you can do, you know, do each floor, cut that in pieces or cut the building first in a couple sections and then do floors for them. And Vico will automatically calculate those quantities um, from the model. Uh, but if you don't have a model, you can also use just 2D drawings and um, get the quantities from there. But the important thing is to get those quantities and not just guess how long something will take. Um, and about the production rates, uh, it's, uh, for example, in Finland we have this um, RATU, which is a, basically a national database that you can purchase that tells us what the production rate is for, for example, pile caps, uh, how much um, rebar, how long that's going to take. So. So I know, at least in Finland, the production rate is a widely used um, thing and it's very important in scheduling and uh, when you're doing bidding. So, for example, rebar production rate is uh, 0.7 tons per man, per man per day. So how many hours for one ton of steel? Eight hours divided by 0.7 tons is 11.4 man hours per ton. So we get the production rate or consumption. So it's basically the consumption or the production rate is something that the, uh, the crew or um, the employee is, go is going to consume. And that's, um, that will help us calculate the duration. Um, and about resources. Uh, resources, obviously, they're a big thing on the job site. Um, obviously, without them, we can't function. And uh, there's a lot of risks um, when, um, when you you know, have uh, the crews going in and out of the job site. As you can see here, um, this is a uh, different color for each resource. And you can see that they're kind of coming and going and there's uh, more demand um, for um, this uh, ceiling crew. So one day they have, they, they have this many and all of a sudden we need more. And this is not even. So whenever uh, a crew has to you know go to another job they might not come back on time and they might you know the task might might be late or um, uh, when you have to bring in new crews you have to train them so they're slower so it makes sense to kind of optimize uh, the work so that you have you know mo you know as close as possible even uh, crews you know you should have maybe six you know crews all the time that know what they're doing and they stay on the job site, um, at the job site as long as possible and don't leave. And they know what they're doing. Because whenever you're sending them home or bringing new guys, there's a risk. So you should kind of level the resources. Um, and just to show, um, uh, you know, optimizing the schedule is here you have uh, two crews, one crew and four crews. And you can see right away that this is a bad schedule. There's big location, you know, areas here, no work, no work here. So what are we going to do about it? There's some numbers, uh, there's durations, and there's number of crews. 
and the production rates. So how do we fix this? Uh, we brought in more crews, and as you can see, the lines got much uh, closer. We have two crews, four crews, and one crews. So just by bringing in more crews, um, we got 12 weeks shorter to total duration. So we got rid of that empty space, those empty areas, and we actually um, you know, are saving 12 weeks. And, we, you know, and you, you, see, you can see the you know, durations here as well, what the difference is. We're still using the same amount of crews, there's still seven, but they're just optimized. Instead of just using four there and one there, we switched four there and one there. So we're actually not, it's not costing us anymore. We're still having the same number of crews on site. We just put them onto a different task to make the other one slower and the other one faster. So that's, um, that's an efficient way to actually um, uh, improve your schedule without actually that costing anything. Um, to optimize, um, you know, we're trying to force um, the con continuity to pr protect, the, you know, resource flow, like I explained, that we should have the continuous work and not send a cruise home. And we're trying to uh, balance the resource to synchronize and production, uh, the production and compress the schedule. Um, and we can add those little buffers. We don't want to make those you know, lines too close. We want to give them little buffers, um, you know, for concrete to dry or in case there's little delays. Um, you know, we want to give them little space in between those locations. And here's a, just a, you know, um, a little view from MGM Grand Hotel uh, in Las Vegas. That, they, you know, they have little lines everywhere there. And you can see that there's the um, resource graph. There's a lot of spikes. Now that they made them more continuous, you can see that the, there are much less spikes here. And actually controlling the resources um, is making a big difference in um, the usage of those resources. And you know, steps for scheduling is basically, you know, of course we have this certain time uh, that we're going to have to do it. It's usually tight. Uh, you know, what's the efficient construction time? We need the locations. We need to select the location sequence, what's the right order of doing those locations. And we create those scheduled tasks. And we time and pace the schedule, you know, seeing, you know, what's the, what's the efficient way of scheduling. And we present the schedule. And we kind of, it's an ongoing process throughout the project. And um, I'll show about the production um, a little bit as well. Um, and just um, to show about the uh, principles. Sorry, I just kind of. Um, so select the most important tasks for the schedule. Uh, we have to measure the schedule tasks. Like I told you, you know, we need we need quantities, we need the consumption, we need the resources, and there's only one task per location at any time. Kind of like you saw in the cartoon. In every warm room, there's only one task going on. Um, you know, they should be entities, meaning that, you know, they're kind of, they're um, uh, one task only that is continuous. Uh, there's technical dependencies. How are they linked to each other? You know, obviously you can't put the frame before you do the foundations. Um, and, you know, when you present the schedule, it's something that you can use to monitor and control the production. And that's something that I'll show next uh, is the production part. Um, and here's a Gantt chart, just an example. Um, I can't say if this is a good schedule. I have no idea. I, I don't know if there's empty space. Um, in this one, I can, again, right away see that there's stops and starts here. Uh, these crews might clash. There's empty space there. I can right away see things that I wouldn't be able to see in the Gantt chart. So there's, uh, you know, certain things that you can find out from the flow line or location-based planning that you can't really see in the Gantt chart. You can't see if something's overlapping, crossing activities, poor location utilities, and stops and starts. So those are, you know, the things that you can actually read from um, from uh, the flow line. And just, um, you know, a little bit um, about the production control. Uh, yep, and versus the project control. 
is that when you're using the flow line, you're actually trying to per control the production. You're being active. You're checking often to see how the crews are going, how are the tasks um, uh, progressing at the job site. You're not just managing things, saying that it's not my problem. Uh, especially if you're char in charge of the contract, you should worry about what your subs are doing as well. So, in, uh, for example, in Vico Office, you can uh, um, once or twice a week, you can uh, tell the software that in location A, a and B, we did, you know, these tasks, and or we did uh, uh, location B, first floor, we did 45%. So, uh, Vico Office will actually predict. Uh, you know, what, when you're going to finish based on these um, actuals that you're recording for each location. So you can have a weekly meeting with subcontractors or your employees and review what the forecast. So I hope you can see um, in the back, um, these little dotted lines, this means that this is what you're actually um, doing. This is your production rate. This is what you wanted to do. Again, here's what you wanted to do, and this is what you actually were doing. So you're late here. And this little uh, longer dotted line here, this is the forecast. So we can see that it's forecasting that this task is fine. We're close to what we, where we want to finish. But we can right away see in just a couple weeks in the project that this drywalling is forecasting that we're screwed. We're, we're in trouble. So, and it's saying that, you know, th there's going to be issue in th this area and this area. So, what are we going to do about it? We, we can tell right away that we're not going to make it if we don't fix something. So, we're going to adjust the schedule. Uh, we're going to fix, uh, you know, a lot of times you can, there's different ways of doing it, but a lot of times it helps to add more crews. So, if we had uh, two crews working on it, we can see, um, uh, you know, or we had one crew working there. What if we add two crews? So that helped. It's, uh, it's going to adjust to the right production rate again. So we fixed the problem by just bringing in uh, one more crew. And uh, there's different ways of doing it. I'll explain in my next presentation about it. But that's how about, it's about controlling the schedule all the time. Every week you can see that how you're doing and it's predicting when you're going to finish. Um, and just about the business value again, it's uh, obviously the idea is to save time and money, of course, uh, less headaches. Uh, you're actually utilizing the whole project for you and your crews. So it is actually uh, a very, very good thing and I think you should definitely look into it. Um, and just on the last slide here, um, just a little um, case study. This is a hospital tower in Oakland, California. Uh, a big medical center. Um, and uh, they did, uh, they converted their Gantt chart into the flow line. So they had 35,000 activities and they converted those into over 1,500 tasks and they actually implemented for production-based project control and they actually reduced schedule risk by a lot and resource usage and optimization by 25%. So there's a lot of case studies if uh, you want to read online on these things, but you know, this thing actually works. Um, and, uh, and that concludes my first part uh, for more information, you can contact vigosoftware.com. There's a lot of um, information about the location-based scheduling, or LBS, and uh, Ernestus is here locally um, answering any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.